The Holy Spirit is the only thing that's true. Love is the only thing that we can hold on to. This world of suffering and chaos and confusion. This world of hate and pain and fear. It's only an illusion. Spirit and we all are here. It manifests itself in everything we see. The sun, the moon, the stars, the mountains and the sea. The Holy Spirit is the only thing that's true. Love is the only thing that we can hold on to. This world of suffering and chaos and confusion. This world of hate and pain and fear, it's only an illusion. Money, power, fame, and material possessions. We have all been trained to give our lives for these obsessions. And so we hurt, we hate, we suffer, and we strive. But all the time the truth is right before our eyes The Holy Spirit is the only thing that's true Love is the only thing that we can hold on to The truth of chaos, of suffering and fusion This world of hate and pain and fear It's only an illusion There's just one power in the universe You can call it Allah, Yahweh, Buddha, Jesus Those are all just words Words can never tell the true eternal town But it's right here Right now The Holy Spirit is the only thing that's true Love is the only thing that we can hold on to this world of suffering, of chaos and confusion This world of hate and pain and fear It's only an illusion It's only an illusion
We are here to play in tune with our natural self in co-creation with the orchestra of life. We are here to weave, braid, and know God through all experiences, foremost in the experience of knowing ourselves as the divine in human form and with humility allowing our soul to co-create with our spirit in alignment with the divine. Amen. Amen. We will continue on with the Lord's Prayer translated from the Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke. You know, that's a good word on the crossword puzzles, Aramaic. You'll find a blue card uh, in your chair, and together let's pray this prayer. Father, Mother, Birther, and Breath of All, create a space inside us and fill it with your presence. Let oneness now prevail. Your one desire then flows through ours as energy fills all form. Give us this day our physical and spiritual nourishment and untangle the knots of error that bind us. As we release others, do not let appearances make us forgetful of the source, but free us to act appropriately. From age to age, through you, flow the glorious harmonies of life, and may these words be fertile statements through which our future grows. Amen. Amen. Can we back up and do a song of Bobby's? Why not? <laughs> Called My Miracle. I thought we did that. Nope. We skipped it. <laughs> we skipped it. We did the first song. We did a well done song. Well, I, I don't need to we argue with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I do not need to argue with you guys. <laughs> Let's have a song of Bobby's called My Miracle. And is there a chorus we should sing along with? Yes. We my repeat miracle. after me. When I say you are, you say you are. When I say my miracle, you say my miracle. It's a Please. Call in the Thank you. Let me turn my guitar on first. <laughs>
<laughs> for any riots, lightning strikes, or attacks by angry villagers armed with torches and pitchforks, which may occur as a result of his cogitations. <laughs> I know what I So, now that everybody's stirred up, we'll go down again. So, into the silence, which is our meditation song. In this world of pain, Sorrows never cease. The weary heart seeks refuge, and the soul cries out for peace. I don't know the answers, but I know where to begin. So I go into the silence. And seek the kingdom that lies within. And when I go into the silence, I leave my thoughts behind. All the worry, pain, and anger that tangle up my mind. And retrieve these feelings any time I choose. But when I go into the silence, there's nothing there for me to lose. And so I go into the silence and I give my mind to Let my thoughts go on without me While I just listen to my breath Sometimes my words ring hollow When I try to say a prayer But when I go into the silence The Holy Spirit's waiting imaginations to tap into our unconscious minds. You know, Sigmund Freud turned out to be wrong about a whole lot of things, but one thing that he did get right, a lot of our thought processes, maybe even most of our thought processes, take place at a level that is outside of our conscious awareness. And if we can bring these unconscious thought processes into our awareness, our lives will be better off. We can make the better decisions when we know what we're really thinking about. <laughs> so uh, we're going to start 
with a little breathing exercise. I think this comes from the ancient Vedic practices, prana yoga, something like that. I don't know. I stole it from Bob Simon. He can tell you more about it than I can. But we're going to just turn our attention to our breath. You can get comfortable. Close your eyes if it feels good to do so. And just think about your breath for a minute. Try to breathe through your abdomen. Keep your shoulders and your ribs still. Make the exhale the active part of the breath and let the inhale be active. Kind of blow it out. Just let it fall back in. And we're going to divide our breathing up into three breaths, three exhales. Let the first exhale be through your nose. Try not to bother your neighbor, but don't be afraid to snore a little bit. Just breathe through your nose. The second breath, we're going to blow out the candles on our birthday cake. And then let the third breath be this great, big, satisfied, ah. And let's just do that once or twice. Nose, candles, big old ah. Nose, candles, big old ah, just four more times. Last time. And as you let your breath return back to its normal rhythm, just take a minute and notice that that's exactly what it does. It falls back into its normal rhythm. You've been breathing all day long, every day since the day you were born. You can take conscious control over your breathing through these little exercises like we've been doing. But most of the time, your breath goes on and works perfectly fine without your breath, knows what it's doing. And this is not simple knowledge. I mean, it's, if you could regulate the oxygen levels in your bloodstream consciously, it would take some math and chemistry that's a lot more advanced than anything I ever learned in school. But your autonomic nervous system does it all day long without any thought from you. Your body, your body possesses a wordless wisdom. And that's what we're going to try to tap into now. And we're just going to use our imagination. We're going to imagine. We're going to pretend like when you were a little kid and you used to play. Just settle down in your chair. Get comfortable. Close your eyes if it feels natural to do so. And just pretend. Just imagine. Just play like. You've got a little valve on the end of your big toe. And just open that valve and let all the stress and tension just flow right out of your body, out the soles of your feet, and be absorbed into the earth. All the worry, all the anger, all the frustrations. The, the book that we're studying in Maryland's uh, Tuesday night Zoom class calls it all your longings and dissatisfactions. <laughs> Let it all just flow out into the earth. And now close that little valve and just imagine, just pretend that your body just starts filling up with gratitude, with peace, with, with compassion, with joy, with love. Picture it like a clear liquid light. It just fills your body up, starts at your toes, goes up through your feet, your ankles, your knees, your thighs, your hips. When you, when you get to your backbone, just imagine, just picture each individual vertebrae just floats in this clear liquid light. And your spine just relaxes and each vertebrae lifts slightly off the one beneath it. Up through your ribs, your shoulders, your neck. Relax your jaw muscles a little bit. When you get to the very top of your head, where your fontanelle used to be when you were a baby, just pretend, just play like it blossoms like a flower. The ancient Sanskrit 
sages called it a, a lotus with a thousand block of petals. And each petal is a beam of light. And it connects you with the entire universe and everything in it, from the tiniest electron to the most distant galaxy. And know that you are a finite expression of the one infinite presence which is everywhere and in all things. And I would like for you to pretend, just play like, Just play with it. You're happy. Without do, trying to do anything or make anything happen, just pretend that everything's taken care of. All your fears are assuaged. All your needs are met. And just pretend, just imagine that you're happy. You're in the best place you could possibly be and everything is all right. And this is your happy place. And now open your third eye, the mind's eye, the eye of your imagination. And take a look around. Notice where you are. This is your happy place. Where are you? It might be a cathedral. It might be a garden. It might be the beach or a mountain stream. It might be a library or a kitchen. It might be a stripper bar in Tijuana. It's your imagination. Take whatever comes. This is your imagination. This is your place. And I want you to think. Just pretend. Just play like. Don't try to do anything or make anything happen. Just pretend. Just play like. You hear footsteps and you know somebody's coming. And you can't remind, quite remember who it is. But you're so glad to see him. Your heart just leaps. You know that it's somebody that loves you. And you love them. And you just can't wait to see them. And they're coming. And you can't quite remember who it is. But you know that it's somebody old and wise and strong and they love every bone in your body, every hair on your head. They love you so much. And they have something very important to tell you. And just take whatever comes. Take the first thing that pops into your mind as you turn your mind's eye towards them and let them come into view. Who is it? What do they say? And there ain't no wrong answers or right answers. It might be Jesus, it might be Buddha, it might be your grandma, it might be Bugs Bunny. It doesn't matter, it's your imagination. Who is it? What do they say? And just consider, just possibly, as we sit for this a minute, what if it was what if this was a message from your unconscious mind? What if you did have a problem to solve or a decision to make? And what if this was a clip? And if it feels good to you, we can go back to our little breathing exercise for a minute. Nose. Candles. Big old eyes. Oh. And let's just sit with that for a minute in silence. Who was it? What did they say?
And as we say goodbye to our imaginary visitors, we prepare to leave our happy place, knowing we can go back any time. But let's all bring our attention back into the room now. Just feel free to stretch a little bit. Look around. Make eye contact with somebody and smile. Let them know you're glad they're here. Tell, turn to somebody and tell them you're glad they're here. Try to mean it if you can. And while you're doing that, I'm going to make my standard disclaimer and remind you that I am without a doubt the least qualified person that has ever stood behind this podium. <laughs> I have no credentials whatsoever. I am not ordained, licensed, sanctified, recognized, or tolerated by any major or minor religion, denomination, sect, coven, or multi-level marketing organization whatsoever. I am not a preacher, I am not a teacher, and I am damn sure not no role model. You're qualified. I have, <laughs> I have lived a life of excess and debauchery, which has worked out pretty well up to now, and I'm not about to change. I have spent... <laughs> I have spent most of my adult life and quite a bit of my childhood in some low-down deal joint or another. Cranking out honky tonk music and dirty jokes, encouraging people to have casual sex with random strangers. Let's all have another drink and don't forget to tip your bartender. That has been my life. But you know, it's a funny thing. When I tell people here at church I play in the bars, most of y'all will say, Well, that's great. Well, we'll come to see you. Where are you going at? When I tell my friends in the bars, that I play in church. More like, oh, church. <laughs> Maybe it's just me, but it seems like churches don't command quite the same measure of respect that they might have in earlier times. I think I might have one contributing factor of why that might be, and that brings me finally to the topic of my talk here. The fifth, the fifth principle of unity. Knowing the truth is not enough. A person must also live the truth that he or she knows. I'm not going to rehash the first four principles for you. Y'all can do your own research. But uh, I do agree with this principle. And I would like to start my speech with a joke. <laughs> I'm kind of scared to do that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, one thing I do know, if you tell the same joke to enough people, sooner or later, it's going to piss one of them off. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for that colorful word. I'm, uh, I'll try to tone down my vocabulary if I can. But if, if I do slip up and use a word that happens to offend you, Please don't get mad at me. Just talk to me after the service. I will bring my list of words that I don't want to hear, and I'm sure we can work something out. <laughs> but I stand by my original statement. You tell the same joke often enough, somebody's going to get mad. Let me give you a little apocryphal story here. Once upon a time, back when I was in show business, we were doing a Christmas show, and there was a little joke in there about Cakes. Uh, basically, it was like how, household hints around the holidays, and the joke was, you know, you don't need to make a new fruit cake every year. Ain't nobody gonna eat that fruit cake. Bugs won't eat that fruit cake. It ain't gonna go bad. You can keep the same fruit cake every year and just serve it over and over. And every year, some lying fool's gonna tell you it was delicious. <laughs> One joke in a ten-minute bit. Not that much of a joke. One night this lady comes up and she's just shaking. She's fighting back tears. She's never been so mad in her life. She says, I work for the Claps and Fruit Cake Company. Oh. <laughs> and you are interfering with my livelihood. <laughs> and she was right. I ain't got no business telling no jokes that's going to get nobody fired from their job. She was right. So if you can't tell a joke about a fruit cake, you need to pick your targets pretty carefully. So I'm going to 
I'm going to go ahead and tell this joke, but I'm really worried about it. I try to stay away from this type of thing. It is, it is an ethnic joke. It's about Baptists. <laughs> you, you used to have Polish jokes, and then you had Bond jokes, and now you got Baptist jokes. I didn't write it. It ain't my joke. But it, it goes like this. If you're going to take a Baptist fishing with you, you have to take two of them because if you only drink, only take one, he's going to drink off all your beer. <laughs> not that much of a joke. Again, I tell it not because it's funny, because I'm trying to make a point here. We know this guy. We know this guy. And it's not just Baptist. I'm sure it would work just as well for Methodists or Nazarenes or any other denomination. It's not just Baptist. We know this guy. Most of us here are old enough to remember back uh, when Dana Carvey was on Saturday Night Live and he used to do the church lady and all she lived for was that moment when she could find some dirt on you so she could do her little superior dance. <laughs> some of us are old enough to remember uh, the old Ray Stevens song where the squirrel got loose in the church and it ran, I love this line, it ran all the way back to the amen pew where sat Sister Bertha better than you who was watching all the commotion with sadistic glee. <laughs> we all know this people. We all know. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about a thing that people do. And it's not just Baptists and it's not just Christians. I'm sure if you're a Hindu, Muslim, whatever, whatever tradition you came from, you know somebody that pretends to be an example of that tradition, but as quick as they think nobody's looking, they'll do anything they can get away with. We know that. And I don't think there's anybody here that doesn't consider that sort of behavior worthy of a little right, light ridicule. Like, does anybody need convincing of that? Does anybody disagree? I, I didn't think so. A class dismissed. I can sit down and shut up. But I do love to hear my voice on the microphone. I still got a few minutes. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to tell you about a guy who really did walk the walk. Uh, you can look him up in the history books. Marcus Aurelius. He was the emperor of Rome back in the second century. He ruled from... Uh, 161 to 180 CE or AD as we used to call it. He literally owned the whole world. He was the emperor of Rome. His word was law. There was nothing he couldn't have. There was nothing he couldn't do. His empire stretched from Spain to Persia. But you know, he was referred to as the last good emperor. And he's always referred to in the history books as one of the one of the most just and wisest and best monarchs that ever sat down on the throne. Full disclosure, a uh, little footnote here. Some of the first uh, Christian persecutions in the Roman Empire did happen under his watch, but it's very doubtful that he ordered it. He had a lot on his plate. There was Germanic tribes in the north. There was a pretender to the throne that came out of Egypt. He, there was plagues and earthquakes. He got a lot on his plate. And he probably saw Christianity as just another group of rebels that had to be dealt with. He probably didn't get much thought at all. But he would not dodge those charges if he were here because when he died, they found these notebooks he'd be, he had been keeping. And he had, they were not for the public. They were his own private diaries. And 2,000 years later, the meditations of Marcus Aurelius are still considered to be some of the deepest and most profound ethical and moral philosophy that's ever been written down. Think about this for a minute. He owned the world. There was literally nothing he couldn't have. If he wanted to get drunk, he, all the wine in the world belonged to him. It, all the people in the world belonged. If he wanted sex, you could not, nobody could refuse him anything. He could do anything he wanted. And yet, there in these private notebooks that he never intended anybody to read, all he's concerned with is personal integrity. I mean, they say absolute power corrupts absolutely, and 
You don't have to look very far to see Nero and Caligula, and they were pretty absolutely corrupt. But here's Marcus Aurelius in the same situation. And he, by all accounts, was a very just and moral person. Somehow it didn't work on him. Nobody ever faced any greater temptations. But his meditation said what he valued above all was personal integrity. This is the guy who really did walk the walk. So what did he say? Well, a lot of it sounds pretty familiar. I don't think uh, I don't think there's anything here in that we the unity principles that we talk about. I don't think there's very much Marcus Aurelius would find to disagree with. But when it comes to that uh, fifth unity principle, he would be all over it. He would agree 100%. One of my favorite quotes from Marcus Aurelius, he says, don't waste time arguing about what a good man should be. Be one. <laughs> that sounds, that sounds kind of unity. If it's not right, don't do it. If it's not true, don't say it. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. I love this one, though. This is my favorite. It's a little off topic here, but I love this one. Stop and ask yourself every now and then, no matter what you're doing, stop and ask yourself, is the reason I'm afraid of dying because I won't be able to do this anymore? <laughs> but you might, you might have noticed there, he did... Uh, he did contradict himself just a little bit. You know, don't waste time about thinking what a good person should be. Be one. That's, that's a real pithy quote. But he spent a lot of time thinking about what a good person should be. And I don't think that time was wasted. Uh, you know, our interpersonal relationships, our daily lives, you know, they're complicated. Where we, spend, we do need to spend a lot of time thinking about it our morality and our ethics. We should do that. But the most important thing is that inward sense of right and wrong that I believe we were all born in. I disagree with Marcus Aurelius just a little bit like that. He, he was a little bit more on the, the nurture side. I believe a little bit more on the nature side. What we call what we call following spirit. He called it being true to yourself. We might call it following spirit. What he meant is that the inner knowing that we can even listen to or not. We have that inner voice. We got a lot of inner voices. We have to spend a lot of time thinking about which one to listen to. But I I do think, I wish we had the, the PowerPoint that we had at the old building. I could show you a video. You could look it up online. I think the key words you would type in would be monkey, cucumber, strawberry. We <laughs> should bring it right up. It's a little psychological experiment then yet. It shows two identical cappuccino monkeys in identical cages. And they're doing the same identical little trick. Push a button, pull a lever, get a reward. Push a button, pull a lever, get a reward. And this one little monkey, every time he does his little trick, he gets a slice of cucumbers. And monkeys like cucumbers, so all is right with the world. He is doing his little, doing his little task and getting his little reward. And everything's good until they lift this little baffle between the cages and he can see that this identical monkey in this identical cage who's doing the identical trick, he's getting a strawberry. That monkey, you should pardon the expression, goes ape. He does a double take that would make Carol Burnett proud, and he throws that cucumber across the room. He starts rattling them bars and screaming. The monkey who's getting the strawberries, by the way, he's fine with it. He just takes his strawberry like, what? I don't know. I wish, I wish that they had continued the experiment and reversed the monkeys. I would like to see 
what would happen if the monkey that had been getting the strawberries started getting cucumbers and they started giving strawberries to the other guy. I believe that he would have reacted just as strongly. You can't, I mean, it's, it's never a good idea to attribute human motivations to animals. But you see that monkey and how mad he gets when he sees that the other guy's getting a strawberry. He has got some sense of right and wrong. He knows that it is not fair. And I think we have that inborn sense as well. When you, children learn how to talk, one of the first things they're going to tell you, it's not fair. We're born with it. We know. And I think that this sheds a little light on one of the doctrines of the Christian church that I, I've struggled with. I'm not a Christian. Uh, a lot of people say I'm not a Christian, but I follow the teachings of Jesus. I might push that a little bit farther and say I'm not a Christian because I follow the teachings of Jesus, but we won't go there. <laughs> I'm a... But the original sin of Adam and Eve was eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. They had no idea of good and evil until they ate the fruit. And eating the fruit was the sin. So before they had any idea of sin, they had already sinned. We don't like to talk about sin too much in unity. And I'm, I'm happy about that. I don't want to change it. I'm sorry I'm bringing up the S word. I tried to say I was not going to use any offensive word. Before I got to my sin. But uh, we're born with this intrinsic sense of right and wrong. But we don't mind as long as we're the ones getting the strawberries. <laughs> it's still fair if I'm getting the strawberries. And I think we're all like that. I, you know, maybe you're the exception. I'm not accusing anybody of anything. But I do believe that this is a very deep part of us as human beings. We will all take that strawberry if we can get it. And that's what Paul was talking about in Romans 3.23. What I think is probably one of the most misunderstood verses in the whole Bible. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What he's talking about is don't think you're any different. Don't think you're any better. You're going to take that strawberry too. And that's what we mean. When we say it's not enough to believe, it's, you know, it's not enough to know the truth. It's, you have to live the truth that you know. And I'm not here to tell you what the truth is. I'm not here to tell you what right or wrong. you got to make up your own mind about that. But Jesus says, go and sin no more. Marcus Aurelius says, if it ain't right, don't do it. We at Unity, we say, it's not enough to know the truth. You've got to live the truth you know. Namaste.
get the golden offering receptacles. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Bobby. Uh, had me spellbound. I just sat there. But <laughs> I usually get up and come on up here, but <laughs> I love you. And uh, everybody else out here loves you as well. You remember the, uh, the blessing, don't you? Uh, divine love flowing through me. Blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. So let's do it again together. Divine love flowing through me, blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God, for the abundant blessings as it flows through us. We know that it is a continual flow so that we are never depleted because we bless and give with joy and peace. Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen.
Thank you, Rob, for the abundant blessings. We now see these tithes and offerings moving through this ministry, doing their perfect work, and then returning to each giver in an abundant way, much more than given. You see this flow moving and multiplying through this ministry and back to each giver. Keep up, press down, children together, but more. Thank you, God. It's so it is. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Gervais. And now it's time for everybody's favorite part of Sunday. I'm going to call, I will call our board chair, John Wilder. Oh, wait, first, I'm going to say, is anyone here for the first time at Unity Myrtle Beach that would like to introduce themselves? Please stand. We want to know you and welcome you. All old timers or members of long standing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we have a prayer box in the back, and we do have prayer chaplains that pray over your concerns. John is going to tell us all about the thrilling things coming up at Union Myrtle Beach, our favorite part of the day. Announcements! Yay! <laughs> Hey, 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 good morning, Unity Myrtle Beach. I would like to thank Bobby for uh, describing very clearly the separation or the fall of man using two monkeys and strawberries and bananas. <laughs> That's pretty good. Isn't it? <laughs> thank you, Bobby. Let's see if I can find the announcements here. Okay, if any of you have prayer requests, we have a prayer box on the back table. The prayer requests are sent to the Unity Prayer Team as well as Solid Unity that's located in Missouri. Tuesday evening metaphysics with Reverend Marilyn Maddox. They're discussing the book, Brave Thinking, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. on Tuesdays. The Zoom info is on the June month at a glance on the back table. Wednesday's book group meeting from 12 to 1.30, Unity's Five Principles, with the facilitator, our own Reverend Margaret Hiller. Next Sunday, August 6th, begins a six-week series on prayer, silence, meditation. Reverend Margaret Hiller will begin with the prayer, Where Do We Begin? <clears throat> See community outreach list for items needed on the back table. The Unity Retreat at Lake Junaluska, South Carolina. North Carolina. This typo is still in there. <laughs> uh, hosted by UMass, which is the Unity Ministers of the Mid-Atlantic States. Tuesday, October 3rd to Friday, October 6th. The flyers on the back table. Now, Mary and I went to that last year, and it was a great, great conference. And I'd like to uh, tell you that on August 1st, this is Tuesday, I believe, there will be a growth and development meeting. And one of the objectives of this meeting is to designate a building committee. We see this as right now as a three-person committee with one person in charge. And we're not, we're not breaking ground or anything. All we're doing is developing a package that would represent what building a church, what would have to come about to build that church. And perhaps develop that package and then, then deliver it formally to the congregation in September. That's our goal. So at this time, I'd like to read. Hot look next week. Yeah, hot look. I forgot about the most important thing. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I got a text today. He said, make sure you talk about potluck. potluck. So anyway. There will be potluck next Sunday over in the barn. Bring a dish. If you don't have a dish, come eat anyway. And the potluck will be right after service. And uh, sometimes we have fruit. Sometimes we have different things to eat. But... Uh, you know it's a great time and the food is actually very good. Yeah. So come next Sunday. 
John, where's the page? So um, the first Monday song circle uh, will be on Tuesday next week because we also have the fire ceremony, silent meditation is always on the 7th because it's a worldwide event that we're joining in. So the fire ceremony will be Monday, August 7th at 6.30. There's flyers on the back table. And then the usual first Monday song circle will be on Tuesday the 8th at 6.30 day 30. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Sorry, sorry for that omission. We need to write that up here. But yes, that's a, that's a really good thing, the fire circle. I've been to that. And of course, uh, the, the group guitar sing on Tuesday is great as well. We thank you, Anton, for leading that charge very much. Okay, at this time, we're going to read the updated prayer for of unity. You'll find that on a card in front of your seat or beside it. Together, the light of God surrounds us. The presence of love enfolds us, the power of peace protects us, and the one presence that lives within all creation enlivens us. Wherever we are, love is, peace is, light is, God is, and all is well. Please stand, we're going to sing the peace song together.